wherever you are in the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is Dr. Nelson Ogunshaki from FIDIC, the city of FIDIC. You are welcome to FIDIC COVID-19 webinar series. This is the sixth of the program that we've launched over the last four weeks. Uh, the first program really focused on geographical issues and what is happening in different parts of the world. We're delighted to have so many people uh, attended that, close to 500 people. Uh, the second one focused on force major, uh, again, well attended event, over 850 people attended that. Third one was really looking at joint venture and looking at the implication on COVID-19. We had close to 600 people that attended that. Uh, looking at consultancy and engineering and the impact of COVID-19, close to 1,000 people were in attendance. And the last one we did was really looking at insurance. We had nearly 700 people in attendance. You are welcome to join us on this sixth program, which is focusing on ADR, which we know that as a number of projects are going through different phases during this COVID-19, there will be challenge with COVID-19. And we do know over the last five particular events that we've had, finding the right solution to overcome the challenges and getting everybody back on course has always been the key challenge. And to that end, we've put this particular program on with fantastic line of speakers, uh, eminent speakers around the world. We're extremely privileged and I'll be introducing them in a little bit. This program should take about one and hour 30 minutes. Uh, my introduction, including the president introduction, which will come in a minute, should not take more than five minutes. I will then invite each panel speaker to speak between five and 10 minutes to give us their view on the subject, which is how are we addressing ADR during this pandemic? The panel has been given a number of headlines, overview of the topics, look at the alternative disk resolution, and to look at you know, disk resolution mechanism to be adopted under the contract, if it's applicable, and to prioritize on how the industry should respond. Once the panel speakers finish their five to 10 minutes, I will then actually cover a Q&A session. We hope to start the Q&A session by one o'clock or in an hour's time, wherever you are in the world. And thereafter, we should finish in one hour, 30 minutes. I hope where you are, you are safe. Are you going to enjoy this conversation? Uh, on the basis of that, I am delighted for the sixth time to invite our president, President Bill Howell, to share an opening speech with you. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nelson, and I will be uh, very brief. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Nelson and his uh, high-quality secretariat staff for putting these webinars uh, on um, in such a uh, a difficult environment. Uh, this is the first time we're doing uh, so many things remotely. I think all of us are. And uh, so far, uh, things have been uh, going pretty well. And there's a lot of work in the background uh, that's done to make sure that happens, and hopefully that will continue. I also would like to personally thank all the speakers we have today. We have a fine, diverse group of incredibly uh, experienced and talented speakers on this very, very important subject of uh, <clears throat> alternative dispute resolution, and in my view, perhaps even more importantly, uh, dispute um, avoidance. Um, before I turn it back to Nelson, I'd just like to make a personal note on this, and this particular subject, I think, is going to be uh, very, very important to all of our firms. It's also a subject that I have a lot of uh, interest in, with my uh, varied career at uh, CDM Smith, I spent a, a lot of years uh, dealing with uh, this particular subject and know how challenging it, could, it can be. Uh, if I've learned anything in that time, it's the importance of having high level uh, relationships and, and good communication with all the stakeholders, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot about that today. So with that, uh, thank you and thank you participants for joining us. Hopefully you'll find the webinar uh, very useful in these challenging times. And with that, I will turn it back to Nelson. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, for that welcome introduction speech. I am well informed by my team. We, we have 1,590 people registered. Right now we have close to 700 people online. That's within five minutes of starting. 
Um, just to echo what Bill said, this has been absolutely phenomenal in terms of representation. We are extremely delighted to have this high caliber of people speaking on behalf of the industry. Uh, without further ado, I am extremely delighted to invite my colleague, uh, my inspired person, which is Aisha Nadal, uh, a board member of Felix, to share a few words with us on this subject. Uh, she's a real expert within our board. Aisha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nelson, and thank you to all the attendees for making the time to join us today. And I'd like to start um, and also thank uh, Bill Howard for leading FIDIC so well, and thank all our esteemed speakers today because we, we for giving of their time in um, helping us all come together in addressing COVID-19, and in particular focusing on alternative ways to avoid disputes and to resolve disputes that, are, that we're all facing um, with this COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I'll start by just kind of setting the stage of using ADR in construction projects. As, as we know, risk and the handling of risk and the managing of risk is not, is not new to construction projects. The construction contract attempts to allocate risk and risks must be handled in a real time fashion to as they eventuate on all construction projects. But with the risk that is posed by COVID-19 around the world, unique and uncertain uh, times require unique and un maybe innovative ways to address uh, this risk using some of the tools that are provided and maybe innovating on those tools. If we look at effective risk management in general, those principles must be applied today. And those, those principles look at avoiding disputes and containing disputes by raising issues early, addressing those issues, and attempting to define a path forward that is timely and in finding that path, setting a stage for open and structured communications such that you can resolve these issues, maybe focusing on your interests and not on your positions. There are a spectrum of tools available that are, that are labeled ADR or alternative dispute resolution or uh, tools they range from where parties negotiate or where they engage a third party neutral to help them through that negotiation or help them define a way forward. If we look at the tools that are available within the FIDIC contracts and the philosophy that underpins them, we find that FIDIC focuses on two principles, a degree of formality in addressing issues and then also maintaining a cooperative approach in determining the solution and the path forward. So we see in, in the FIDIC machinery that we have tools for potential creative settlement, but we always focus on some degree of formality in documenting your current position and doing it and documenting it contemporaneously in the process of claims. So we find a, a multi-tiered approach where claims are presented to the engineer if risks eventuate in this situation of COVID-19, the claims are presented to the engineer. The engineer can work with both parties, the employer and the contractor to attempt to find a settlement or an agreement or a path forward that meets the interests of both parties. We also focus on having another tier, uh, a dispute adjudication board, or in the 2017 suite, we've entitled it the dispute avoidance and adjudication board to underscore that there is a potential for it's a standing board and to underscore the potential for a approaching that board for an informal opinion such that the parties can define a path forward 
that is unique to the, this exceptional event of COVID-19. But the key aspect is to define a situation that focuses on mutually assured success it's, it, and focusing on the win of the project, the win of both parties at the same time in defining that, in defining this new path forward and in meeting this. So it is that the tools are available to focus on collaboration, but we also focus on not forgetting the documentation and the formality. This is a time for all, for all of us to sit around the virtual table and use all available tools to focus on not only mutually assured survival, but a mutual assured success. So with that, I, um, I will leave it to my esteemed colleagues to uh, define the, the various tools and the various approaches that are being used around the world. And with that, I turn it back to Nelson. Thank you very much, Aisha, for that uh, uh, opening speech, which set the scene really in terms of moving forward. I'm now going to uh, tap into the best brain in the world that we are privileged to have available. Um, whilst we've got uh, five speakers to follow Aisha, I thought it would be appropriate that at this point that I invite Sir Vivian Ramsey to open the floor uh, to sort of share his thoughts on the subject, uh, bearing in mind his global perspective on the subject uh, and his role in terms of you know, ADL and arbitration and also. So Sir Vivian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelson. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be speaking to everybody uh, from my study in England. Uh, normally, uh, I've been speaking at FIDIC events uh, from some other part of the world uh, and wiring into those events, but uh, obviously things change. Uh, let's look at ADR. Uh, obviously, uh, why is it there? Uh, first of all, when I started out, it was... Uh, arbitration or litigation was really uh, the choice uh, that you had. And I think uh, there are still a number of countries where that's still very much the way in which they deal uh, with disputes. Uh, but an alternative way of, of dealing with disputes is essential. And I think especially essential uh, in this current pandemic. Uh, one of the difficulties that most people are finding now, uh, rather like when they're ch checking their insurance policies, is that their contracts don't actually meet a pandemic situation. And so they have uh, this difficulty uh, of trying to uh, match the situation with the terms of the contract. And that's where uh, hard legal principles which can be established through arbitration, uh, litigation, or some form of adjudication, uh, don't really match the bill. And therefore, uh, I think ADR becomes an even more important uh, way of dealing with things. I think one has to be realistic, though, uh, because there are two schools of thought, and I'm a member of uh, dispute boards, uh, mediator, arbitration, arbitrator, and uh, uh, sitting courts uh, and the views I'm picking up around the world are that uh, either the two parties to a construction contract see this pandemic as something which is a joint challenge to them both and they are willing to move into the other person's position rather more willingly or there are a number of contracts which were difficult contracts to start with, uh, and each party, in a sense, is hardened by this because they can't afford uh, to lose a lot of money, uh, either by uh, having uh, subcontractors not turn up, supplies not turn up from the contractor's side, or from the employer's side not having a building to hand over on the particular date. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, both of those types of party uh, benefit from some form uh, of uh, ADR. What are we talking about ADR? Uh, I have to say research shows that in fact, negotiation 
is still the most popular form of ADR, where the two parties get together and they resolve it. But as we know, that doesn't always work. And very often the assistance uh, of either uh, some form of advisor to each party or a neutral uh, to assist them is of great uh, import. Uh, obviously, uh, there are, I think, uh, I counted in one year, I had acted in 17 forms of ADR. Uh, and one can see them from mini trials, from early neutral evaluation, conciliation, mediation, almost every other form you can think of. Uh, but I think particularly we moved into a, an era now of dispute avoidance. Uh, and dispute avoidance, I think, uh, I first came across in a, a major way when we had the London Olympics 2012, uh, where they had a standing uh, dispute avoidance panel in order to deal with disputes uh, on that uh, project. Uh, and in fact, uh, as part of the uh, English court system, as a judge in the Technology and Construction Court, uh, we produced early neutral evaluations, which was part of the assistance uh, of that dispute avoidance uh, process. Uh, and now I think uh, most of the dispute boards I'm on have been converted in one way or another into uh, a form of dispute avoidance. Uh, that is not always easy uh, because some parties, uh, particularly uh, uh, throughout the world would prefer somebody to make a decision. They don't find uh, making a decision based on a neutral always very easy. Uh, and uh, they would prefer somebody to come down and say, this is your right uh, and that's the way you have to deal with it. Uh, and that's a reason, sometimes it's a chain of command that somebody who is dealing with the project uh, does not want to have to explain to someone higher up that they uh, can't resolve it. Sometimes there are corruption concerns in particular countries and sometimes culturally uh, a particular uh, individual or a particular organization uh, can't uh, find a way of coming into a dispute avoidance process. And sometimes I have to say it's institutional. I've had some insurance uh, uh, clients acting on behalf of parties who uh, shy away from uh, uh, dispute avoidance. Uh, but the strength of dispute avoidance is very often it can craft a solution, slightly like one in mediation, uh, which allows the parties to come uh, to a solution uh, which isn't based on the hard uh, legal principles of the contract. Uh, and I think for those clients, and I think the majority are, understanding the other party's position, uh, it provides now, I think, an essential way of dealing with things uh, in this uh, pandemic. Particularly, I would say, uh, the virtual uh, way of dealing with disputes uh, which I've now dealt with both mediation, I've dealt with arbitration, I've dealt with court proceedings, adjudications, uh, virtually, uh, both before the pandemic and now during the pandemic. Uh, and I think one can adjust one's whole mindset uh, to deal with things virtually, which at one stage we said there was nothing quite to replace a person-to-person -person contact but I think we're changing. I think that probably gives people uh, at least an introduction. And I know uh, one of the problems of speaking first and then speaking second is the second person says, uh, you've said everything. So I've left a few gaps, I hope, uh, for the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Vivian Ramsey, for that uh, good insight, a very good introduction point. And I like the point that negotiation is still the biggest means of resolving the issue. But I also like the point of giving all the challenges in different areas uh, one needs to be mindful of. 
I'm going to invite William Godwin now to step in and give his five to seven minutes if possible. Uh, speak on the same subject, and we are looking forward to a, an interesting interacting section. William, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nelson, and um, my, my thanks and uh, uh, gratitude to um, Sir Vivian for so uh, helpfully mapping out the terrain and um, covering actually an awful lot of extremely important ground. Um, can I just start by um, asking um, uh, a perhaps not too obvious question, why ADR? Um, what is it against which we are seeking to um, provide protection to the parties? Um, the um, alternative to ADR is um, formal methods of dispute resolution that result in a final decision on the dispute. And they broadly divide into arbitration, where the parties agree on their forum uh, and where the power of the arbitrators derives solely from the parties' agreement, uh, and litigation uh, in a local court. Um, the advantages of arbitration over litigation as a formal means of resolving disputes um, have been extremely well ventilated and they apply particularly strongly in the case of cross-border contracts where um, uh, the risk of non-enforcement when you eventually obtain your decision um, are rather greater with a local court judgment uh, than they are in relation to an arbitral decision, thanks to the New York Convention. Um, but the, um, the thing about uh, formal methods of resolving disputes, which do result in decisions and therefore can provide uh, parties and their advisors with at least that degree of certainty um, is that they are extremely destructive. Um, they are destructive to the commercial relationship between the parties. Um, they um, typically involve, even with well-managed arbitrations, uh, enormous expense, quite often beyond that which the parties originally estimated. Um, and the result is intrinsically uncertain. So there's an awful lot to be said for looking at alternatives, and alternatives to formal methods of dispute resolution are many and various. So Vivian highlighted uh, the importance um, of simply talking, of having uh, negotiations between the two parties taking place informally. Um, that is uh, also, in my experience, uh, potentially a very effective method of resolving a dispute at an early stage, um, where uh, in particular the parties have a genuine mutual wish to seek uh, a solution. It's absolutely essential that they should have that wish. Um, the way in which those negotiations might take place um, could be by, for example, senior management meetings where the discussions might be treated as without prejudice in certain jurisdictions, in many jurisdictions, the parties can agree that anything they say, including any concessions made during such negotiations, cannot be used subsequently against them if uh, recourse to a formal method of dispute resolution um, eventually occurs. So that's an extremely important and um, widespread method of trying to nip a dispute in the bud. A tear up from that is mediation, um, which is really a highly structured form of negotiation because mediators don't produce decisions. They merely facilitate agreement between the parties. Um, there it's extremely important to get the right mediator, uh, a person mutually respected, uh, who also has a reasonably good grasp of the legal as well as the factual and technical issues. Um, in my own experience, mediation is extremely effective in resolving disputes, not necessarily on the day, but if you've got a good mediator and a certain amount of goodwill between the parties, um, a mediation can act as a catalyst for subsequent discussion and negotiation, which may uh, eventually result in a settlement at least of, of many of the issues uh, in dispute, even if not all of them. Um, there are all sorts of other alternatives. Um, there's 
as Sir Vivian pointed out, there's early neutral evaluation. Um, you can have expert determinations where you've got a highly technical issue and the parties really need a decision uh, from an expert. Um, those are alternatives to arbitration or litigation. Um, but a, a form of alternative dispute resolution um, which figures prominently in the FIDIC forms since at least the Orange Book in 1995 um, is uh, the dispute board. And um, dispute boards divide broadly into two categories. You've got a dispute review board, which makes recommendations rather than decisions. And you've got a dispute adjudication board, which makes decisions which are binding, subject um, to final decision in an arbitration or a local court, uh, depending on the particular process. The um, FIDIC uh, Dispute Adjudication Board, the DAB, um, uh, has under the 2017 contracts been reformulated as the, as the Dispute Avoidance and Adjudication Board um, to reflect, as Nelson pointed out in his introduction, um, the increased and enhanced emphasis on dispute avoidance in the FIDIC forms, uh, in the 2017 forms. Um, and that takes a number of um, uh, directions, um, uh, not least the introduction of a new Clause 21, dealing with dispute resolution distinctly from claims. Under the 1999 editions in Clause 20, we dealt with contractors' claims and dispute resolution. And that created uh, the 2017 contracts thought the wrong mindset. You wanted to distinguish clearly between claims and dispute resolution because not all, every claim necessarily results in a dispute. But the DAAB um, has this enhanced uh, role. And um, one of the important features of that role has been the availability of the DAAB to uh, provide advice and informal discussion as a, a forum for informal discussion between the parties in an attempt to reach agreement before the dispute goes very much further, in particular to a DAAB actual decision. Um, uh, an interesting feature of the new Clause 21 is that the DAAB has express, um, it, ex it expressly provides for the DAAB to invite the parties to request jointly that the DAAB should embark on um, uh, such a, an informal process of discussion and advice. Um, and um, the, um, the DAAB um, uh, under the 2017 forms is in all cases now a standing DAAB, whereas under the first editions, it was only in the red book that the default position was that the DAAB should be a standing one. And that's a, a very important development because it's only really with a standing DAAB that this important dispute avoidance function can properly be um, implemented and carried into effect. Um, can I just conclude, because uh, I don't want to exceed my limit and there's an awful lot of further material to cover, with just identifying what from my experience um, can often be the causes of disputes in construction projects. Um, clearly, dispute resolution is important, and who can say uh, that we've ever had a more pressing time when thinking about these things was, very, was, was more important. It's hard to imagine um, uh, a more pressing time than to consider these very important topics. Dispute resolution, very important. Dispute avoidance, a related but distinct concept. Um, how do you avoid disputes from taking root in the first place, still less resolve them when they do take root? Well, first and foremost, um, lack of communication is, in my experience, and I'm sure this is shared with um, many, many people listening and taking part, um, is one of the root causes of disputes arising in the first place. And that doesn't just mean um, being available to listen, it means engaging with your counterparty. It means keeping organized and proper channels of communication open so that when issues arise, you deal with them swiftly and effectively. Um, another potential source of disputes is 
um, the um, failure to follow procedures. Um, but on that note, uh, perhaps I can uh, now conclude and pass back to Nelson. Thank you very much, uh, Williams. Uh, I think you, once again, you build on Sir Vivian. Um, and I think the bit that I liked most was saying, if you don't follow the right path, it is very destructive. Uh, and you echo the point about the issue of not being able to resolve a lack of communication. I think that trend will come true again in all of the idea. Um, negotiations still be one of the key areas. So on this point, I'm really going to invite Nicholas, Nicholas Good from Penwick Elliott uh, to take the floor and share his perspective on the same subject, albeit from a slightly different angle. Nicholas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Nelson. So. Um, um, hello to everybody who's, who's joined this webinar today. It's nice to see so many people have logged in. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of themes um, and um, I'm going to start out with communication. Uh, President Bill mentioned that at the start and, and other speakers have done also. And that's crucial when we're looking at progressing projects without problems or trying to avoid disputes or trying to solve disputes. Uh, and um, I, I think that um, uh, if all the time that you can continue communication on projects, Possibly they will be more successful, but when you do have problems, you might be able to find a way around them. Uh, and that brings me then on to ADR. Uh, uh, the real purpose of an alternative approach, or, or such as mediation or conciliation, is to have a third party that aids communication. That's, that's really what mediation or conciliation is all about. Um, uh, and it might be that perhaps communication has broken down when we end up at the dispute resolution procedure, which becomes binding. And it's tempting to think of these techniques in that way. Uh, but it might not necessarily be the case because authority to settle is another issue. And I'm going to come back to that in a, in a moment. But as you can see from the, the 1999 FIDIC uh, contracts through to 2017, a couple of important changes were made, um, giving the dispute board that greater flexibility in, in relation to the avoidance function, emphasizing that not just in the contract, but also in the Golden Principles. I don't know if any of you have, have looked at the Golden Principles published last year by FIDIC, but um, the, there's a great emphasis on the dispute board and its function. So do have a look at that uh, download from, from FIDIC, which I think everyone, is, everyone should have a look at. Um, and then what about um, the use of mediation and conciliation? Uh, from my experience, I know in the 90s, uh, people seem to be um, talking about mediation, but not really using it. And there was some research done in the mid 90s, which showed certainly in construction, most people were talking about it, but only about 5% or less than 5% of those disputes in construction actually got near a mediation. It wasn't until about 2010 that um, a much greater take up had occurred. And there is some research uh, done at King's College, published in 2010 on mediating construction disputes in association with the court in the UK which showed that by this stage, about a third of all disputes that went to the court were settled by mediation or conciliation. So a great improvement um, there. You can download that um, uh, report for free if you look on the internet. It's called uh, Mediating Construction Disputes 2010. Um, but how about internationally then? Um, so from my experience, it, it's been a bit slower, I suppose, although people are now beginning to mediate and conciliate around the world. Uh, and this then really brings me back to this issue about authority. Um, as a practitioner working often for one or, one or the other parties, uh, what you find is that the contractual the supply chain usually has the authority to negotiate and, and, and try to do deals and attend a mediation or sit in front of the dispute board to have um, avoidance type discussions rather than necessarily go to a formal dispute. But it's not always the case with the employers. If they're government agencies um, or if they're in a country which has been given um, multilateral development bank funding or grants, usually they have authority to, to complete that project and spend the money available. But actually to deal with claims and disputes and, and settle them is extremely challenging. And I think that's the real issue for people around the world today. So just, just I wanted to give you three quick examples in relation to how you might deal with that. Um, it was no different actually in the UK in the 90s and, and, and I was involved in a large Ministry of Defence claim uh, and the government at that time issued some short guidance which said we really should be trying to use ADR and possibly mediation uh, and the MOD wasn't quite sure how to go about doing this. No one really had the authority to sit in a room and, and 
uh, and do a deal basically uh, they could attend a mediation and they could they could share their views they even knew what their positions might be and where and where a sensible settlement might occur but it was about authority um, and what happened um, was that um, in the end they engaged an external law firm which gave them a report with um, I think a quantum person assisting them which gave them a range to settle within so they went to the mediation um, and within that range they managed to reach a settlement uh, and then as part of the settlement agreement that report was suddenly produced it was included uh, and used as their um, objective external authority in order to do the deal so that was quite encouraging um, uh, a second example is using that process uh, in a developing country same process um, uh, i was assisting the government an external advisor was brought in just to produce uh, a report for the purposes of audit um, and that meant that a deal could be then done because those signing up the deal would be able to say they weren't just relying on, on the lawyers that had been brought in but they had an external report also and this this seems to be a good way forward uh, my final example um, it is where this wasn't possible um, and, and what tended to happen with the uh, ongoing mediation uh, was quite successful um, sessions taking two and three days over a period of a year meeting up um, eventually really getting a deal that looked quite good and then um, the government having to go the government party having to go back to try to get formal agreement and, and it just never happened each time they returned the deal was entirely different and, and didn't work so I think those are the real challenges. I think that the FIDIC contract's there now. It's got the mechanics in it. Um, you can find good conciliators and mediators, and dispute boards are certainly keen to help. I think the challenge is, is just um, uh, authority, really, um, internationally. So anyway, Nelson, there's my thoughts, and, and I'll hand back to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for that. I mean, I, I, I like the two points you pick up, which are <clears throat> one is about communication. So that's the role of the mediator or the ADL. And the second one which you pick up is about authority, and that to me are the two golden issues. Not having the authority to make decisions, and the challenges that goes with international particular governments. So I'll pick those two points up Thank as you. a takeaway for me. I'm now going to invite, I believe it's going to be uh, Mario or James, is it? I think it's going to be Mario, Mario. Mario, I think the floor is yours. Mario, can you unmute, please? Mario, are you there? Can you unmute? Yes, please. Thank you. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, can you go Okay, on sorry, for, sorry for that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, greetings uh, from Bern, uh, Switzerland. Um, I'm happy to uh, add a Swiss perspective uh, to the discussions. Uh, as to a large part of uh, parts of the world, uh, obviously Switzerland is heavily touched by the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Schools, restaurants, um, shops are closed. Uh, the construction industry, um, the people are still working up to now and uh, with the exception of some minor parts mainly in the southern part, the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland, but generally there were, were no official closure uh, of construction uh, sites in Switzerland. Of course, uh, strict uh, health measures must be respected by all companies, including uh, on construction uh, sites. So um, obviously also in Switzerland, uh, there are various legal, legal questions that are discussed and debated at the moment. Uh, as in other places of the world, we can uh, see many reasons for potential disputes in, in the current situation. For example, the closure of construction sites by either the employer or the contractor. Uh, contractor. Uh, we may have difficulties and delays in deliveries uh, of materials, for example. There may be delays in the work process or in the delivery of documents by architects or engineers due to lack of staff. And finally, there are often the inefficiencies due to the additional compliance with health and safety uh, measures. Um, obviously, uh, we lawyers routinely refer to the contractual basis of any such uh, dispute. Um, there may be uh, clauses uh, which are of relevance and which help find a solution uh, to any given 
uh, dispute. In Switzerland, we, uh, the large majority of important uh, infrastructure uh, projects are based on a model construction contract according to the so-called norm SAA 118, which is a private norm issued by the Swiss Society of Engineers and uh, Architects. It's a bit like the FIDIC uh, Red Book. You have to incorporate it into your contract, contract to be uh, so that it is uh, applicable. And as uh, the FIDIC um, contracts, uh, SAA 118 also gives a good basis, I think, for most of the important legal topics that may occur in the current situation. However, I think um, in, in this situation at the moment, we have two elements that are extraordinary. Uh, first, um, uh, we do not discuss a single or particular case, but the legal questions arise epidemically as well. It is hard to imagine that there is uh, uh, one ongoing project uh, that is not affected by COVID-19 impediments. And secondly, um, uh, quite honestly, we have to deal with legal concepts and questions we don't really know very well and uh, which we are not used uh, to discuss. We lack experience with these questions. Often references made to ancient legal writings or to case law from the big uh, wars. Um, so as a consequence, there is a tremendous demand to find solutions to a huge number of similar problems and cases, while at the same time, uh, there is very little confidence and certainty about the right legal way to tackle uh, those uh, issues. So uh, what, what can we do? Um, uh, obviously, litigation or arbitration, to be quite frank, seem to be the, the worst option. It takes a lot of time, it's very costly, and, and we also have the risk uh, of diverging judgments from different courts uh, or tribunals, given that uh, the legal uh, situation is somehow uh, unclear. And, and it, will, it will take years uh, to get a Supreme Court decision, for example, which will bring uh, a uniform understanding of some legal concepts. So by all means, uh, I think uh, litigation, arbitration would be our last resort in, in this comment situation. Um, so we may opt for more flexible but still formalized ADR methods such as mediation as we uh, heard before. Um, in Switzerland such methods are not widely used uh, in the construction industry. There is no law imposing any special form of dispute resolution uh, under Swiss law for construction disputes. Um, there is, again, from this uh, Swiss uh, Society of Engineers and Architects, there is an ordinance 150 that proposes a, uh, some kind of procedure that may be useful and, and helpful. I think in the current situation we have, if you look at ADR, we have two fundamental uh, problems. Um, the one is that all these procedures still are normally quite lengthy processes. It may take months or years until a dispute is uh, resolved and eventually money flows to uh, one or the other party. And on the other hand, um, uh, it's, it only resolves one um, issue at a time, one case uh, at a time. Um, uh, so in, in, in our current COVID-19 situation, I think uh, we're faced with two challenges compared to these fundamental problems. One is time may be of the essence. Many contractors uh, face tough liquidity problems, so they need to get quick compensation and uh, not a compensation anytime in the far future, so quick money is, is key. And um, on the other hand, as I said, both employers and contractors will often be faced with, with issues and disputes in many construction projects at the same time. So they need to resolve those issues in, in parallel. They cannot just focus on one uh, given case. So what would we need to have uh, successful uh, RDR procedures? I think we must be able to start quickly, first of all. Um, so it may be an advantage if uh, we already have uh, a standing dispute board in, in place or already have nominated a mediator. 
Then, well, secondly, we, we may want to streamline the procedure to be more efficient, to be quicker, uh, to resolve a problem. And finally, obviously, in the current situation, we want to make sure that we can have discussions remotely uh, by video conferencing and uh, possibly we don't want to have uh, site visits, which probably, if mainly legal questions are concerned, should uh, not be possible in, in many cases. And then we should also bear in mind, I think, that um, uh, obviously it's not only in the interest uh, of the contractor to find a solution to to simply survive uh, um, um, and save the company. But most of the time, it's also in the interest of the employer that the contractor finds ground and can continue uh, its business. Not only wishes the employer to continue um, its project uh, in the current setup, obviously, but it may, uh, the, the employer may have further projects with the same contractor and uh, would not uh, want uh, that those uh, uh, projects are affected by an insolvency of the contractor, for example. Also, if you think uh, of, uh, of a public employer, a government um, authority, um, such uh, employer may consider the economic or social consequences of, of an uh, epidemic failure of its uh, construction uh, industry. So I think it should be in the interest of, of, of all stakeholders that all the parties uh, stay uh, in business. So my plea, uh, therefore, uh, goes for direct talks and negotiations between the parties. And I guess in the most quick and most informal way that uh, may be possible, such negotiations obviously should be done um, uh, based on mutual confidence, uh, on a basis of good faith, and in the respect of this extraordinary situation. I think everybody should bear that uh, in, in mind. And I think to, to conclude, uh, an idea we are discussing in Switzerland right now, uh, I, I wonder, my, uh, we, we put the question, um, whether it is possible in any given jurisdiction or at least with any given important employer to create like within the industry a common form of understanding of uh, open legal issues of the interpretation of a, of a disputed contract clause, for example. In this respect, I find uh, very helpful that uh, FIDIC um, uh, published uh, a memorandum uh, to users of FIDIC standard forms of contract, of works contract. You can find that on the FIDIC website, which was published a couple of days ago. And I think it's very helpful to, to create a, a common understanding. In, in Switzerland, what we did uh, a couple of, of weeks ago or, or even days, we launched uh, a joint initiative uh, by uh, USIC, uh, that's uh, the Swiss Association of Consulting Engineers I'm, I'm, I'm running in Switzerland. Uh, and on the other hand, the SBB, that's the Swiss National Railway Company. So what they did, uh, the railway company, uh, just after the start of, the, of this whole crisis, they, they voluntarily shut down uh, quite a, a large number of their, of their infrastructure, infrastructure construction sites. And they realized that it was not a good idea. So a couple of weeks later, they reopened uh, the construction sites. And as you can imagine, they got hundreds of uh, nice letters from uh, contractors uh, with compensation uh, claims. So um, uh, they have the option to, to go into fights with all these different contractors, or, uh, and that's the alternative we try to, to set up now, is a plan for the industry that we work towards obtaining a neutral expert legal opinion on the consequences of such a construction site closure. And uh, such expert opinion um, shall then help the whole industry to speed up the discussions they have. And we hope that uh, such opinion can serve as a basis for rapid out of court dispute resolution uh, with these various uh, stakeholders. We will see how it, how it works, but I think it's one innovative way to tackle the, the issue on an on a industry wide level. That's all from my side. Thank you, Nelson. Mario, thank you very much for uh, that uh, way of putting the Swiss uh, perspective into it. I mean, it's quite clear that even though if the FIDIC contract is not used in Switzerland, there is a mechanism at the moment which, from what you've said, uh, can be litigious, can be long. Uh, and the concern I think you raise is that we need to find a mutually acceptable way to go forward 
um, you cited the issue about the PILIC guidance note, which is a good reference. And I think I also remember Nicola talked about the golden principle earlier on, but the key message that I picked up, we, we need to find a amicable solution that expedites the solution very quickly, which goes back to what Sir Vivian was saying at the beginning, a negotiation solution. But you also talked about expert legal opinion, and that may help. I mean, it may be a case of Switzerland, and the same issue may apply. I'm now going to invite James Perry, who is the president of this resolution board, uh, to give us his perspective, particularly from the DAB point of view, uh, because this is a area that I believe not only Philip, but globally, that is widely seen. And so, James, can I ask you to take the floor uh, and share your thoughts with us on the subject before we go into the open question and answer? Thank you, James. Thank you very much, Nelson. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here today on behalf of the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation, and I appreciate your inviting us to, to join you. Uh, I'd like to say congratulations too, Nelson. Uh, what you've been able to put in place, I think you have a series of 18 uh, COVID-19 seminars planned. Uh, putting them together on, on this kind of notice uh, is very useful. Uh, the quality of presentations, the, the expertise you're making available to your stakeholders is really admirable and congratulations on that effort to you and everybody at the FIDIC team. Thank you very much. Um, of course, we're going to be talking still about ADR, but I'd like to focus uh, on the, uh, the part where the rubber meets the road at the moment. Um, this is all moving very fast. Uh, six weeks ago, sites were working all over Europe and other places in the world. And uh, under these conditions, uh, the facts have to be dealt with uh, right now. Uh, under the fitted forms of contracts, we have uh, two tiers, uh, three tiers really, of dispute resolution, as we've already talked about. But we're maybe forgetting a little bit about the first tier, and that's the engineer. I think the engineer has a very important role at this point in time. Uh, engineers don't need to be waiting for the claim to come in and issuing determinations. Engineers can be very active at this point. They can be the leaders. They can be putting together crisis management meetings, trying to help the parties figure out uh, what is going to be the roadmap going forward. Uh, I think it's already been mentioned uh, by Sir Vivian, negotiations are key. Engineers can help broker those negotiations. Sometimes non-contractual solutions are the answer. And again, the engineer might be the best position to try to broker maybe non-contractual solutions as well. Uh, key issues have to be solved right now. Some countries have shut down sites. That poses certain issues about suspension, demobilization. Other countries have uh, some very ambiguous uh, decrees in place about what a site can do. Many aren't shut officially. Uh, so what do you do? Do you continue uh, when you're trying to deal with social distancing? That can become very expensive for projects. There's going to be uh, disruption. There's going to be loss of productivity. What about delivery of uh, plants and materials? Uh, what about union relationships? What about health and safety rules, obligations to work in teams? These issues, I think, are all extremely important and need to be discussed openly between the parties right now is what is the best solution for our project? At the end of the day, it's going to come down to costs and costs in time. Uh, costs uh, are not going to go away. It's like the virus. This cost issue is going to be with us uh, for many months, if not years, trying to figure out uh, 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 how much this is costing each individual project. Uh, the issue today should be not on who is going to pay the costs, but on how we can mitigate these costs. And again, the engineer, I think, is in the best position uh, to try to help the parties come up with the, uh, with the right strategy and plan to, to move forward. Uh, that doesn't mean that the dispute, board, uh, uh, the dispute board shouldn't be active. And I'm assuming that we're working with standing dispute boards here, because obviously, if you've not got a dispute board in place already, or you have ad hoc dispute board provisions in your contract, it's perhaps going to be a little difficult to get an effective dispute board in place um, during the actual uh, unrolling of these facts at the moment. Uh, if you have a standing dispute board, I think it's extremely important that the dispute board stay engaged and that you as parties believe that the dispute board should stay engaged. 
Uh, it can help even in the crisis management uh, situation. It can join forces with the engineer. It can participate in crisis management discussions either as an observer or uh, as a facilitator to the discussions. As Nicholas Gould is saying, sometimes having a, a, a neutral person involved in these situations can help. But I think it's very important that dispute boards at this moment uh, function in dispute avoidance role as much as possible. Uh, dispute boards should be facilitators of negotiations. They should be facilitators of transparency and communications. And they should be encouraging the parties to work towards solutions uh, uh, of their own as much as possible. Um, the uh, site visits, of course, are going to be badly disrupted at the moment. Uh, travel is, is likely to be uh, off limits for long distance dispute boards for a number of months, even after confinement and, and lockdowns are lifted around the world. International travel is going to be complicated. So platforms like we have here, uh, Zoom, other platforms are highly recommended uh, for use for dispute boards, whether it's to convene extraordinary meetings with the parties or whether it is uh, simply to have your regular site, uh, uh, site visit uh, discussions that you might have had normally. Very important to maintain those and try to keep the uh, discussion and, and open channels of communications as much as possible. Um, I believe that uh, the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation's Executive Director, Ann Russo, is, is probably listening. Uh, sometimes the issues uh, and challenges for parties are technical. How do you, how do you uh, organize all of these uh, video conferences? Not everybody is comfortable with the technology. Um, uh, for anybody listening, uh, the DRBF is uh, available to try to help you understand some of these platforms and, and help you put in place alternatives uh, to keep your communications going as much as possible. Um, in conclusion, um, it is uh, uh, absolutely, in my view, essential uh, that this, uh, the uh, dispute boards continue to do their job, uh, that they try to work as, uh, very much as a team, as much as possible, uh, with the engineer, with the parties. Uh, as Aisha said at the beginning, we're at a time where we're looking at innovation, and we're looking at creativity, uh, all the tools I think I've just described exist under any of the forms of fitted contracts since the Orange Book 1995. We have the ability for dispute avoidance. And uh, we also, uh, I think, will very quickly need to come into uh, the issues of uh, resolving some of these contractual questions. Um, and please don't forget about the opportunity to use the dispute board to give non-binding opinions. Uh, dispute boards can issue non-binding opinions uh, when both parties agree to do so. And we're going to be facing interesting and difficult questions about force majeure, about changes in legislation, uh, about extensions of time. And uh, I think dispute boards can help uh, by using this tool. Um, I would just finally add that uh, uh, dispute boards, um, of course, are not mediators. Uh, we are not able to step outside of the contract if we're asked to give a formal decision, um, but uh, dispute boards should be, and I think generally they are, very careful to make sure that the parties are allowed enough room to negotiate and to come up with a solution that suits their particular needs. Uh, Nelson, thanks very much again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, James, for, for that uh, very quick uh, introduction into how you can leverage on the dispute board. Uh, I'm going to start with the Q&A session, but I'm going to actually take the first five minutes uh, and then hopefully uh, my team should open up the chat corridor now for questions to come through. We currently have 840 people online listening to us. Uh, we've just done one hour, we have 30 minutes to go. So once the question is flowing through, can I start off with James, since you are hot of the press? I am in a contract, and the contract does not have any dispute uh, DAB clause in it. Do I have a right to make a request for a dispute board to be set up very quickly to help solve the problem? James? The quick answer is, is uh, yes, it's certainly possible. I see it happen fairly regularly, but it does require agreement of both parties. And uh, likely, if you're doing it correctly, you'll need a, an amendment to the contract to uh, make provisions to allow for that. Right. 
Uh, Nicholas, can I bring you back on? You talked eloquently about role of communicator and authority in your questioning earlier on. So I'm going to try and play back at you. Uh, what's the different? I mean, I do know it, but I mean, I think the question that may come from the floor is what is the difference between mediator and the dispute board? You know, what, what authority goes with the two? I mean, I think I have an idea, but can you please expand on that? Nicholas. Can you unmute, please? I can't hear you. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, there's a good question. And, you know, it comes up all the time because people are always thinking that surely a mediator and an adjudicator do the same thing. Um, and, of course, um, whilst the individual could, there is a massive difference between the two. Um, and, and it's repeated, of course, under FIDIC following the international norms. And that is that the, an, an adjudicator can make a binding decision on the parties, um, regardless of what the parties think about it. Whereas a mediator can't do that. The mediator's role is to help the parties reach their own agreement. So it's power to settle. The power to settle uh, with mediation and conciliation is with the parties. Uh, and, and you give that up when you go before a judge or an arbitrator or an adjudicator. And, and Nelson, you know, the strange thing is, it's actually easier to just let the adjudicator decide. It's actually a lot more hard work and more challenging, you know, to come together and, and, and work hard to try to find that deal. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to go to Sir Vivian. The uh, question that I have for you is, what is the impact of COVID-19 on the arbitration procedure? I mean, what is the significance? Is there any significance or is it business as usual? Sir Vivian, can you unmute, please? Sir Vivian, Ramsey? are you still with Good. us? Good. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, Nelson, I think one can say that the arbitration community uh, has rather changed its tune. I think all arbitrators and all parties have always said, we can't possibly have this witnessed by video conference. We can't make submissions by video conference because we want face-to-face -face hearings. Uh, but my experience, all my hearings, certainly until September, are now taking place virtually, very successfully. And from September onwards, everybody is holding in readiness a virtual hearing in case we can't have a live hearing. And so I think one may find that uh, one of the um, silver linings of this situation is that fewer people have to tra travel all over the world to attend arbitration hearings. Uh, of course, arbitrations uh, take a long time to come on. And so it is really the ones which are already in place, which are being affected. And the ones which are now being started will come on for hearing probably late 21, uh, early 22. And so those will be, I think, less affected. So while I have you on, Savivian, can I press you a little bit on that? Because I hear earlier on in uh, Mario's uh, comment to say, uh, you need a, a legal statement or legal guidance and the issue about working virtual is we need to be enshrined in the way matters are being resolved. And if I put it back in my days as a practitioner, whether I'm as an expert witness and I need to go out on site, you know, how much can I rely on this uh, virtual world uh, in evidence in, in the whole proceeding, whether it's mediation, conciliation or arbitration, how much can we place reliance on that? Bearing in mind that we hear about fake news, fake image and fake things, how much reliance can you place on that? Well, it's quite interesting because uh, on a lot of projects where sites are continuing, uh, a lot of the professional staff are working from home. And so that's a rather different uh, position. But as always, uh, records are the most important thing. Uh, and uh, uh, records of what's happening on site on a day-by-day -day basis uh, are absolutely essential. Uh, and very often uh, now, either through drone or other photography, uh, we now have a complete picture of what happens on a site uh, on, if not a, an hour by hour basis, on a week by week basis. And so I think that uh, so far as evidence is concerned, uh, it will be much the same as it's always been. Uh, there will be some disputes on fact but most of the facts will come from documents and film records. 
Thank you very much, Sir Vivian. Uh, William, can I bring you back on board? I'm on my hot seat right now. I'm not picking up any floor. This is straight playing back at what you said earlier on. Um, the question goes is that we are not able to meet the deadline of submission due to COVID-19. What can be the consequence and what can we do? So if there is a time bar in any contract and I need to submit, but I cannot submit that because of COVID-19, we heard it from other speaker, either government decision, you can't move, you can't travel, you can't do that. How do we play onto that? William, your thing. Well, um, in practical terms, I think if you possibly can, uh, you should um, aim to get your submission in on time. Um, but if you really can't, then um, the, um, the contract may well contain provision uh, that permits um, the relevant decision maker to uh, extend time, uh, but only if you can set out very good and compelling reasons why that should be extended. So, for example, um, under the 2017 FIDIC contracts, um, whereas before the contractor's initial notice was absolutely barred, if he was later than the 28 days, um, uh, you are able to um, seek um, an extension of time um, as long as you can uh, provide sufficiently good reasons for doing so. Um, uh, and that was it first introduced in the Gold Book in 2008. Um, so look very closely at your contract, look very closely at your governing law, um, but if you ever possibly can, just try and get that submission in on time. Thank you very much. Uh, Aisha, can I bring you back on? I know you are waiting for me to pan. Uh, the question goes, is that um, I want to appoint a district board to assist in district avoidance during the pandemic. Should I appoint a standing district board or ad hoc? What, what is your recommendation? Well, uh, it, it, that you, you, you gave me a, a nice easy one, a standing dispute board. Uh, as we heard from Mario, uh, time is of the essence. In, in Switzerland, they need ready solutions. You can't wait uh, for the procedure to appoint the board. So if you have a dispute board in place now, which is a standing dispute board, as Jim pointed out, you can turn to them and ask them for an informal opinion. Although they don't act as a mediator, but they're there and you have ready access to them. An ad hoc dispute board, on the other hand, now would require a formal procedure to agree with your party or not in the case of non-agreement, then go to an appointing authority such as FIDIC and, and the president's, um, FIDIC appointment to the president's, which is a formal procedure, takes time. Uh, so standing would be the short answer. Okay, thank you standing. very much. Thank you. Uh, Jim, wait, if you're still there, Jim, I need you, I need your face here. Quick one for you. Um, I'm operating in a very, very challenging country and jurisdiction. The word DAB does not exist, and neither would they recognize it. But we know with the pandemic and all the challenges that goes, we need to find a quick solution that keeps the project going. What do I do? Jim? Well, as I, as I, uh, I think the answer to the question earlier, uh, there's absolutely no reason why you can't put in place um, a dispute board by agreement between the parties at any time. And dispute boards don't always have to issue uh, binding decisions. Um, they do in the FIDIC contracts, and I believe that that's a very good choice. Uh, but if you look at other rules for uh, dispute boards, the ICC, for instance, gives you the option of recommendations. And uh, in the United States, the practice is recommendations rather than binding decisions. So I, I think that uh, at this particular junction with COVID-19, uh, the issues that are going to come out of it, it's important to have the dialogue and, as um, Nicholas Gould said earlier, uh, be able to uh, facilitate that with a neutral. So I, I do think that there's a lot of options there, even uh, if you uh, don't worry about whether the binding decision or is going to be enforceable or even if there is a binding decision. Uh, this may be a time for dialogue, and that's probably what the dispute board's best at anyway. Right. Thank you very much. I'm not going to start picking up questions from the floor. Please pardon me if I don't come across very well. I'm going to try and read it as best as I can. 
And uh, the first one that I see coming through is that uh, uh, I think it's a question. He said, um, "What is the cost of the price of human life lost under the COVID-19 at construction cost?" Uh, this is linked by damages, I presume. So, who's equipped to do that, William? <laughs> The, human, the cost of a human life uh, in yeah. damages terms. Well, um, <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> um, uh, economists, I think, have various measures for valuing a life. Um, but I suppose the broader question or the broader issue is um, how you quantify such matters for purposes of making a claim. Uh, and I guess the ultimate answer will depend on the, the law that governs the dispute and the, uh, the, the law that governs your contract. So you would, look at, um, you would look at the governing law. If it's English law, you'd look at law relating to damages and you'd try your best to quantify on that basis. But I think beyond that, I'd, I'd be um, uh, rather uh, reluctant to go, I think. Is there any of my learned person on the uh, panel willing to have a go on that? Or should I move swiftly to the next question? The question that I hear from the floor from uh, Ahmed is, who can challenge the decision by the dispute board? Uh, can I bring James back in? James, who can challenge the dispute board decision? Well, once the dispute board decision is issued, and assuming it's it's binding, uh, there is a, a provision that allows you to issue a, a broad notice of dissatisfaction. Either party, uh, uh, either party can issue a notice of dissatisfaction, and uh, that generally preserves your rights to uh, take the issue on to ar the arbitration procedure later on. Uh, so that's that's provided for in in FIDIC contract and and just about any rules that exist on dispute boards. My other question is coming through is that my question is to the all panelists. My client has provided me with a special permit to work in the construction site under the crisis, but at the same time, it's essential to work safely. So a contractor, how can I reserve my right to claim and avoid any dispute with my employer? Question, who wish to take that? Nicholas? Yes, okay. Um, I, I think that the answer really is more of a, a factual one. Um, um, you know, if you can work safely on your site, well, surely you should be anyway. And this is the real question. And, and this is the, the, the issue we've been looking at, not just in the UK, but generally around the world. Is it possible to have social distancing on the site with the workers? Is it possible for them to use the canteen facilities and so on and so forth, get to work at all, bearing in mind there might be a lockdown? And I think that really, that's, that, that's where the answer comes from. It's all very well to have an instruction to proceed. Um, but the question is, can it be done safely? And, and this might just, you know, not, not just be about what the contract says, but health and safety, health and safety generally. And, and under all the contracts, you need to comply with the health and safety legislation. And, you know, the real question is, can, uh, can that site operate safely and effectively? And uh, well, I know one recently that shut down simply because the um, external private health and safety advisors said that they were not going to visit the site. They didn't believe that it was um, sensible or practical and they didn't believe the site could continue functioning. And that brought that end to everything quite swiftly. Thank you very much. Uh, can I bring uh, Mario on the table? Mario, in your presentation earlier on, you talked about uh, providing uh, a situation where uh, the FIDIC produced a, a guidance and memorandum that allows you to look at different scenarios even though the FIDIC contract is not directly applicable. Do you find that producing such a document, does it help you to reference uh, best practice globally? Or is it a case that this is the way things work in Switzerland and perhaps the same thing happens in different parts of the world and therefore you can't reference best practice? What is the situation in Switzerland on that? I think it, it definitely helps because, as I mentioned in my in my presentation, there there are questions that we're not used to discuss. We 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 talked about it when I was in law school. There was textbook cases, but as a lawyer, I was never faced with such situations. So there, there's a huge un uncertainty, and I think in this situation, every best practice document, uh, be it national or international, may, may help, may help to, to get a, 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 common, a common understanding. 
obviously that will be challenged by national law that is governing the contract. Um, so uh, still open to debate, but I think it's it's definitely a, a good thing, and uh, I encourage Fedik to to continue uh, on this route. Thank you very much. I've got a question. I think this is directly to Nicola. I think me and Nicola are going to be in good conversation after this meeting. This is to do with the authority you talked about earlier, Nicola. Uh, the question is how to overcome the problem of authority to negotiate for sure to sub clause 3.5 when the employer is under the obligation to receive a no objection by the MDD for waiving a contract provision. Nicola. Sorry, when the uh, employer is required to get authority from the bank? Yes. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is one of those difficult areas, really, um, because um, between the contractor and the employer, as far as they're concerned, um, they're just dealing with each other under the contract. The contractor is obliged to get on and, and build the project. Um, and if third party or, um, authorizations are required, then the employer needs to deal with that in sufficient time to allow the contractor to um, proceed. Um, but I think this is a, a real issue because often what you find is that um, if big decisions need to be made, very rarely uh, is it possible to get those quickly. Uh, and this is typically an area where you do end up having a dispute, uh, which is difficult to resolve. Uh, I'm just going to make a, a sort of a statement here, uh, which is really recognizing the state of the world that we are in. A lot of people lost their life and we do empathize with them. There is a question that's come through, which sounds very sad. And it said, if a subcontractor workers die on site, due to COVID-19 on site, who is liable to take care of the compensation, damages, men or subcontractor or refer to government? Interesting question. It just shows that the challenge we face is not just about time and money, it's people's life. Do you want to take that off, uh, Nicholas, while you're online? Yeah, I, and do you know the answer? This is probably going to vary as you go around the world because um, the subcontractors should have insurances for dealing with their, their operatives and much will depend on whether they're employed or self-employed or quite how they're contracted and that would be the first port of call but you know sometimes we find looking at international projects that, that there aren't the right insurances in place this is quite a complex um, topic really um, uh, and I, I have known of situations where um, uh, employers have stepped in to, to try to help with those uh, situations, but that can be difficult uh, also. Um, one of the strange things about setting large projects up at the start is that people are desperate to get on site and build because that's what we all do. But thinking about uh, insurances, I know that this was covered uh, last week, it, it's not straightforward, but it's really important. And, you know, insurance is there for those, those um terrible disaster subject to the terms and, 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 and not, it's not always easy to, to, to claim on them. And unfortunately, you know, I think in the coming weeks and months, we're going to hear more and more of these very difficult, tough stories. And that's, that's why I think it's so important to really think about whether you can progress safely and properly on site. It's not just about getting on with the physical works. It's looking after the health and safety of the people. And, you know, it, it, just one, one last point on that. It's quite interesting that um, uh, some contractors I know have, have said to the engineer or employer, look, we, you know, we're struggling to, to get on with the project because of social distancing and so on. Uh, and the answer is, please, you know, just, just carry on. If they're invited to site to see for themselves, that request not being taken up very much. So I think that speaks volumes about how difficult you know, it really is out there at the moment. Thank you. So, Vivian, do you have a view on that subject that uh, Nicholas uh, just expressed a view on? Uh, <clears throat> yes. I mean, obviously, uh, the question of liability <clears throat> for employees is normally a question for the employer of a particular employee. Uh, and one of the key matters which uh, Nicholas has mentioned is there's clearly a duty in most legal systems uh, for uh, an employer to take reasonable care of their employees. Uh, and there are clearly certain times when uh, social distancing is not possible. Uh, but equally, there are other uh, devices being used now, such as um, sensors, which say when you are within two meters of another worker, uh, and all sorts of other uh, things that happen. Uh, but we know that there are certain construction operations which can't be carried out safely with social distancing. And I think uh, it's a difficult call for uh, 
employers of employees uh, as to what they do in those circumstances. Uh, and I think many of them have taken a view that it's better to preserve the life of their workers uh, than to risk uh, that life. And of course, testing, widespread testing isn't available. Uh, so you do not know whether the person you're dealing with, in fact, it has uh, COVID. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna go across to William Godwin. A uh, question from the floor. What provision must be covered in a new contract for pandemic situation? William? Provisions to cover for pandemic situation. Yeah, in the new contract, I think this is more of a prevention on the assumption that we may have another fallback. I hope not. <laughs> mm. Well, um, preventative clauses, I guess the, um, the most obvious um, kind of clause is the force majeure clause, which has, of course, been the sub subject of a, an earlier webinar in this uh, extremely helpful series. Um, uh, pandemic uh, is not in the FIDIC contract specifically singled out as a, um, a, a type of natural catastrophe, but um, I, I see no reason why, um, because the list under the FIDIC clauses is, is never closed, um, uh, a, a pandemic or the effects of a pandemic like this um, should not be um, uh, eligible for a a, a force majeure claim. Um, of course, the effect of force majeure is to um, postpone or suspend obligations rather than uh, avoid them or bring them uh, to an end altogether. Um, and, um, uh, and that uh, uh, needs to be borne in mind, uh, as well as, of course, the notice requirements, which have to be followed to the letter. Um, but that would be the most obvious contractual provision I would say one would be very, very um, keen to ensure was there. Um, you also have the, the governing law of the contract, which could provide, um, for example, uh, a, a, a way of um, bringing the contract to an end. Uh, if you think of the English law doctrine of frustration, for example, it could be that um, a pandemic like this gives rise to a situation where frustration could be relied upon uh, or similar doctrines under different systems of law, which, which may govern the particular contract. Um, but um, it, it's, it, it needs to be carefully thought about. Um, it, it should also be remembered that um, uh, in addition to force majeure, which prevents under the FIDIC clauses, not merely hinders, but prevents performance of the relevant obligations, um, you may be able to rely on, on a clause eight um, extension of time claim where um, the effects of the COVID or similar pandemic um, hinders or delays, um, uh, depending on your particular contract, hinders or delays performance. Um, so I think, I think those are the things to, to look for roughly. Okay, thank you very much. There is a question coming from Flo. Uh, since it is the contractor's responsibility to supply PPE, can the contractor recover the cost, the, the extended cost of COVID-19 PPE from the owner? Question, uh, Nicola, Nicholas, please. Thanks for picking on me with that one. Um, <laughs> the, um, the interesting question, because of course, the, they're already obliged, aren't they, to provide quite a lot of PPE. And in reality, most of these sites, they should all be already wearing gloves, for example, or for most of the operations. And if it's an operation that they can't wear gloves for, well, then that's a different matter. But I, I think if it's um, a change in the law that's occurred after the base date, uh, and then they have to do something extra and additional, then they would have a valid claim for that. Now, I'm conscious of question buzzing, right? And I won't be able to go through them. But my excellent team are picking up those questions and we do everything we can to try and address that. Time is not on our side. Our industry has always been criticized, not finishing on time to cost. So I wanted to finish on time on cost. So my question to each and every one of you in the panel, in one sentence, before I invite Aisha to round up, is starting from Bill, as brief as possible. William, this is coming to you. Over the coming weeks, FIDIC plan to continue this series of COVID-19 and its impact on projects. What area of FIDIC activity, FIDIC contract, do you think we should focus on to make sure that we are relevant and we are addressing the need of the industry? We are not biased that everything has to be FIDIC, 
what Philip promotes about best industry, best practice. So I'm looking for one sentence starting from William Godwin, as quick as you can, William. Anything which encourages and facilitates greater communication as at earlier stage as possible, I would say. Thank you very much. Nicholas, your comments, advice. Uh, I, I like the communication point. It's so good. You know, it's one of my favorite, but I'm going to have to say um, that to be clear about your levels of authority so that if you are going to have discussions to try to resolve issues and problems that you, you all know that you've got the power to do it and, and have a meaningful, useful discussion and move on efficiently and economically. Thank you very much. Can I bring, uh, uh, I think it's with Mario. I'm doing it in a reverse order than Mario. <laughs> no, we talked about it earlier. I, I think it's very important that you communicate to your members and to, to, to the community that you publish best practice, that you do memoranda. So continue this way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to call James, your view, your comment, your advice. Well, thank you. I, I think absolutely allow the parties to negotiate uh, and discuss, give them as much room as possible for that. Um, senior management, I forgot to mention as well. William Godwin brought that up. Uh, try to have the senior management involved in these discussions as much as you can. And going forward, I think it would be interesting to, at least as part of one of the seminars, talk a little bit more about the changes in legislation and how that uh, might uh, impact. We focus on force majeure, we focus on the insurance, but I think changes in legislation will turn out to be a very important element of all of this. Thank you very much, Jane, for that uh, uh, sweet one. So Vivian, uh, please, your word of uh, advice, pearl of wisdom. Well, I think one of the interesting things is we're all concentrating on the position now. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I think one knows from a historic perspective is that in arbitration and litigation, we will be dealing with these disputes in 18 months' time, uh, when, if I can put it, the heat of the pandemic, we hope, has died. And by then, uh, I think one has to be aware that people will not have quite the same attitude as they have now. So my uh, advice uh, uh, on a point is to prepare yourself as if you were going to have that final dispute resolution process and not let your guard down because uh, arguments will come at a later date. Thank you very much. Since I have the president sitting there waiting, I'm going to give him one minute. President Bill Howard, one minute. What's your word of counsel advice? And I'm going to bring Aisha in after. Bill, one minute. <clears throat> This has been a terrific seminar. So that's a statement, not advice. But one thought that, um, that I had, and a lot of it is on my own personal experience as well, is in the event we've got a, an issue or a dispute or a claim where the parties want to resolve matters fairly, um, I believe we're going to be... Um, in a resource limited situation as, as, uh, cause I can't find a better way to describe it. I think the workload in the area of dispute resolution, et cetera, is going to be huge, uh, because this is all a global issue. So I would suggest that in, in the, in the circumstances where parties really want an, a, uh, outside opinion and want to resolve matters, that you look to experienced engineers and construction personnel, perhaps who are retired, I don't know, maybe Thanks someone well. like me, to, uh, to help in, uh, in trying to establish something that's fair. It Thank only you. works, however, if everyone wants to resolve a matter, so. Thank you, that's a good takeaway, mutual interest. Aisha, the floor is yours, can you help me? Uh, close out, and then I'll come on, you know, wrap up. I'll go. I will, I will be, I can't do justice. I mean, we had some very excellent presentations, starting with Sir Vivian talking about that negotiations, ADR tools are, there's a wide spectrum, but negotiations are still one of the strongest um, and, and most used tools. And he also cautioned that parties' willingness to engage in ADR may be affected by culture, by the chain of command, or possibly by corruption. But we are at a time right now that maybe we can't find a solution that's based purely on rights and obligations. And as Bill Godwin pointed out, that if we focus on a, on a 
turning over a decision to a third party, we may be follow we're following an adversarial path that takes time and money and could be destructive to parties' relationships. And I think all, all the speakers underline that it's not only the interest of the cash flow for the contractor, but it's also the employer's interest to de ultimately deliver a project, could be a government and the like. And we need to look for creative ways to find expedient solutions in this time without forgetting the procedural documentation. So we have to bring everybody around the virtual table and give them the tools to address solutions, uh, possibly a DAB, possibly mediation. As Sir Vivian mentioned, he was engaged in 17 uh, various types of ADRs. So there's a wide spectrum that's available. So how to engage the engineer, like Jim said, how to engage the DB, how to engage the employer and bring them around this virtual table and yet not forget to document, document, document. So you've got to prepare for the worst that you may ultimately end in litigation or arbitration, but hope for the best and give yourself the best possible chance at a triple win, winning for the project, winning for the contractor and the employer in facing this COVID-19 risk. Back to you, Nelson. Aisha, thank you very much uh, for that good summation. I think I couldn't do it any better than that. I'm, so I'm glad that I've got a co-pilot that's navigating the journey. Um, I just want to start by saying we've had close to 900 people uh, that have physically been uh, the whole program. That's absolutely superb. Um, I want to thank all the speakers uh, from Bill Howard, uh, President Aisha Nada, constantly supporting us on this subject. Sir Vivian Ramsey, William Godwin, Nicholas Nugu, uh, James you know, uh, Perry, and also Mario Marti. Thank you very much for the excellent contribution. Thank you for giving us the time, considering the short notice, and you responded very well, all of you in your convenient home. May I say thank you to all the you know, participants, wherever you are around the world. Uh, I thank you for your support. We've, this is the seat here. We've got 12 more to go. We're going to have a week break next week. Because I need to do my duty of dealing with my board. Uh, after May, well, I think it's first week in May, we start another run where we'll be looking at the practicality of what does this mean in the new world of virtual world. We've heard about being 3D technology. My view on it is that the world will change. Uh, the way we're going to work is going to change. And we need to look at the world I hear again and again all morning is virtual, virtual, whether it's evident, working remote and making sure people are safe. So we'll be looking at that. So what does it mean to start looking at, you know, the beam software technology for the new world working? We had about using drone and all that means in the new world, both in new front end of investigation, project delivery, and the, the forensic side. So I just want to use this opportunity to thank you to everybody. Thank you to my team, Barbara, you know, everybody behind the scene, Andy, who is noting all the message that's coming through, and also Nadia, who's working on our digital, and thanks to the entire team within Philly for all your excellent work. So on that note, I'm going to wish you all the very best. Please keep safe. Thank you very much. God bless. Thanks very much, Nelson. Thank, Thank you. you Nelson. Thanks a lot. Thank you.